London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. In this, the inaugural episode of the podcast, I speak with the founder of Inner City Books, Jungian analyst and author Daryl Sharp. Daryl invited me to record our first interview in his home, which is also the headquarters of the publishing house he started back in 1980. So last week I flew to Toronto and spent an entire day with Daryl in that lovely Victorian house, where we shared a couple of meals and did a lot of talking. This was the first interview I've ever recorded. It's been something I've been wanting to do for many years, and it's finally the right time to begin. It's been an enormous undertaking, and it's only just begun. Because this is all new to me, I must say that it came out a little rough on my end, but I have to start somewhere. So if you'll bear with me and stay with me, I promise you the quality will get better with time. Let us begin. Uh, Yungi and Laura, welcome from Oak Park, Illinois. Thank you, Daryl. Come all the way from Toronto to Elephant House to talk about Young and Inner City books. Your work on Twitter has endeared uh, me and my colleagues to your work and your knowledge of Young. Well, thank you for and saying your that. Interest and appreciation of our titles has been a joy. Well, thank you. Thank you for the material. It's uh, it's really been a great topic of conversation on Twitter, uh, quotes from books that you've published. So we're sitting here today uh, in your consultation room in these very comfortable chairs, and it just so happens that on the table next to us is the elephant, the elephant that started it all. Well, it didn't start inner city books. It started me writing the book called Jung Unplugged My Life as an Elephant, which is a metaphor for my time in, anal in analysis. And how that happened, I was walking in the hills of Zurich one day, and I spied on the trail uh, a little ebony object, which I picked up, and it turned out to be a small little uh, elephant. And I took that to be an instance, an event of synchronistic importance, by which I mean I decided to take it seriously as a reflection of something going on in me that corresponded without a cause to an event that happened in the outside world. Would you define the word synchronicity? Jung's briefest definition is that it is an a-causal coincidence between two events, one external in the real world and one psychic in someone's mind. And these happen to coincide without any apparent cause. That's why he calls it a-causal. Uh, many people would call it just a coincidence, but that's uh, not what synchronicity isn't simply a coincidence. It's a meaningful connection between the internal and the outside, and that led eventually to his more extensive writings and research on what he called the psychoid archetype, which is some unknown place in space or in the world where things happen that have meaning but no apparent cause. So that led him away from the Newtonian view of cause and effect. Revolutionary at the time. Now people use the word synchronicity rather loosely and more often they use it as a or mistakenly as a synonym for coincidence. So the but difference between a coincidence and a synchronicity is meaning in the mind of the beholder, mm -hmm. like beauty. <laughs> and you have to be sentient enough to see that there is some correspondence mm. somehow. And that's what led me to investigate what elephants might mean to me and why I, at that particular time, would chance upon one, apparently for no reason. 
but I decided there must, there could be some reason. So I went to the zoo and looked at, watched elephants, and I read about elephants, and I drew elephants, and I sculpted elephants, and I became elephantine in my thinking. Mm -hmm. And is there lurking there in your pretty mind another question? So you happened upon that elephant in the hills of Zurich, yes. and it led you down that path. Yes. What did you derive from that? Ultimately, where did that lead you? It lead me, led me to my elephant complex, mm -hmm. which, is, in my imagination, is native to the astrological sign of Capricorn. Mm firmly fixed on the ground, mm -hmm. substantial in nature, and incidentally showed me where I was going off my rightful path in my current life, mm -hmm. which we needn't go into because that takes us too far afield, and it's too uh, personal. Mm -hmm. But you get the idea, I think, that I received this message as a metaphorical challenge mm -hmm. to rediscover myself, which I did over time by taking my dreams seriously, particularly, because the unconscious is where we get information that isn't otherwise ordinarily available to us. Mm -hmm. You called this an elephant complex. What do you mean by complex? A complex is a group of emotional associations surrounding a particular concept mm -hmm. or idea or person even. And you, I think of my mother, all the associations that go with mother make up uh, my mother complex. Mm -hmm. And my experience of other women have contributed to that complex, which basically is a the archetype of the feminine, mm -hmm. informed initially by a man's mother, and then accreted or modified by his life experience. Mm -hmm. So you called that an elephant complex, and so it's all about your associations around elephants? Well, it, it became that, but before I stumbled on this little creature, I had no... Uh, notion of what an elephant might mean to me. Mm -hmm. I had to be motivated by that event to look into it. Mm -hmm. I was reading a tribute that you wrote to uh, memory of Marie-Louise von Franz. You actually met her when you were in Zurich in 1976. She actually played a very large role in your training. In the tribute, you discuss how she opened your eyes to your personal psychology. And I, I'd like to ask you about how that happened and your happening upon uh, one of her books. That particular book is called The Problem of the Puer Eternus, which was initially published in 1970 by Spring Publications. Much later in 19, in the year 2000, I acquired the rights to it and republished it. I re-edited the original, which had some, had a lot of typos and grammatical mm -hmm. errors, and I indexed it as well. So the, her initial influence was through the written word. Mm -hmm. And I, although I went to Zurich in 1974, I didn't. Uh, she, I attended some of her lectures, but I didn't meet her in person until 1976 when I went for a single consultation. And then she was my examiner in fairy tale exam that takes place halfway through one's training uh, called the Propodoidicum, and it's a series of exams on dreams and fairy tales and myths and cultural, what's the word your friends use? Cultural anthropology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an exam on cultural anthropology. Anyway, von Franz was chosen as my fairy tale examiner. 
And I thought I was well prepared because I'd read all her fairy tale books, her interpretations of fairy tales, the feminine in fairy tales, the shadow in fairy tales, individuation in fairy tales, and so on. And I was a great fan of her work, and I thought I knew it pretty cold. And I don't remember the fairy tale she gave me at the time to comment on, which was the substance of the exam. Mm -hmm. uh, I do remember that I fumbled about in my mind to find something to say and could hardly find a word that was appropriate. And at the end of 45 minutes, she said, you're a real ninny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perhaps you shouldn't be here. <laughs> and so I slunk out, expecting to have failed that exam. But she gave me a three, which is a threshold of passing. Mm -hmm. I then went home appropriately humbled and reread everything she'd written for the next two years before the final exam on which she was also, I chose her as my fairy tale examiner. Now, I was much more psychologically together by then and uh, not overconfident as I had been. And so I, it was a written exam. Mm -hmm. So I wrote about 10 or 12 pages, and, uh, oh, it was on, I remember the fairy tale, it was the glass mountain about a hero who has to climb the black, the glass mountain to get to the princess, and surrounding the glass mountain is a moat that is filled with the bodies of other would-be heroes mm. who had failed. Mm. Uh, so there's a lot of symbolism involved in it and the animals he meets on the ways and synchronistic events and so I thought I had done pretty well on that written exam and when I got the paper back from her it, it was accompanied by a note by a second reader of the paper who said uh, this won't do at all and she wrote on the bottom of the paper this man knows his stuff A plus so I was very pleased mm -hmm. to have pleased her. You, you had written, the independent examiner refused a mark, saying, quote, he must have cheated. Oh, Von okay. Kranz gave me a one and penciled a terse note, quote, he knows his stuff. Well, I guess I just remembered <laughs> that detail. Thank you for reminding me. You wrote, she prepared me for what was coming, which is to say I could appreciate intellectually with my thinking function, her analysis of the mother-bound man, but I did not truly see its relevance to me from a feeling standpoint, that is, until I was on my knees three years later. Then her words pierced my heart. Tough to take, but her cogent comments on men who sounded suspiciously like me, devastating as they were to my image of myself, offered an implicit alternative to killing myself. Yes. You, you went on to say, needless to say, I took the alternative. I went into analysis. Yes. And what is your question? My question is, there are a lot of people out there that feel that way, that are on their knees and don't know where to turn. And a lot of them turn to alcohol, to drugs, to quick fix crisis management type therapy that yes. they'll do for three months and then stop. <clears throat> you didn't choose those paths. You chose another path. Well, I had read Jung, and I, when I woke up crying one morning uncontrollably, I knew that, if I, that I needed some help, and I knew it had to be with a Jungian-oriented uh, therapist someone who knew at least more than I did about Jungian ideas because I liked the spirit of what I had read in, um, by Jung and his followers like Hellman and 
Edward Whitmont, who wrote The Symbolic Quest, uh, and Von Franz. And so uh, I happened to be staying in London, England at the time with a friend who noticed, well, realized my distress, mm -hmm. and I told him some of the background and the reasons for my distress. And he said, well, you should see somebody. And I said, well, I'd love to, but there aren't any analysts in Canada. He said, well, I happen to know a very prominent Jungian analyst in London, uh, England. Mm -hmm. And he said he might have space. He might be able to see you. So I phoned him right away, and that analyst turned out to be Anthony Stevens, whose work I subsequently published mm -hmm. many years later. Uh, he uh, agreed to see me right away, I think the next day, and that started uh, a year-long association with uh, Dr. Stevens, which changed my life because when I went back to Canada, Oh, then, while I was working with Dr. Stevens, I accidentally or synchronistically met a man who said he was training to be a Freudian analyst. He wasn't an MD, and uh, it was the first realization I had that there were such a thing as an, a lay analyst. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to be a medical doctor. So... I went back and talked to my host, who had been thinking of training as a Jungian analyst himself, and together we did some research on the Jung Institute in Zurich. Mm -hmm. And a couple of weeks later, I went to Zurich and talked to the director of training about the possibilities. And I was invited to submit an application and with some recommendations, reference letters, uh, which I subsequently did, and I was accepted, but I had to wait a year. Oh, why is that? They said they they were too full at the moment. Oh, I see. So the following October, I was accepted to enter training. Mm-hmm. So I came back to Canada, and where I worked in various jobs for a year, and sorted out my situation with my wife and my then three children, and uh, went back to London, England, to work to continue working with Tony Stevens. Mm -hmm. Uh, to make up the, the hours I needed in uh, to qualify for training in Zurich. So I just like would like to clarify this. Um, what is required of one that would like to become a Jungian analyst? Um, the initial, re the, the basic requirement is 100 hours of Jungian analysis plus a graduate degree in something. Mm -hmm. And it could be anything. It could be anything. Uh, for some of my colleagues, it was uh, fine arts, mm -hmm. uh, a diploma in filmography, mm -hmm. uh, as long as it was a graduate degree. Graduate degree. And then you Post are... Post-BA. Right, and then you are required to have had a hundred hours of analysis with a Jungian analyst. Yes. And does Had to that be with a Jungian analyst? Does that need to be done before you start your training, or before you finish your training? Before you start, when you get into training, you have to accumulate four hundred hours of personal analysis mm -hmm. before you can graduate. Do you know of any other, for instance, the Freudians, do they have a requirement similar to that? I don't I'm sure they do, but do I don't they? know their mm -hmm. regulations. Mm -hmm. Every other Jungian uh, Institute has varying requirements for entry. Some are 50 hours of personal analysis, some are more. Some even require an MD. 
I think the San Francisco Institute requires an MD or a PhD in psychology. Mm -hmm. So when you got to Zurich in the fall of 1974, you wrote that you had abandoned your wife and your three young children. You said, in favor of my own potential renewal. Yes. What did that mean? Well, I knew I was such a mess. I had to do something. I was no, of no use to anybody, mm -hmm. especially them. Um, so it was a matter of survival for me uh, to be in analysis. But to me, it, it would take a tremendous amount of strength to work on yourself when things aren't going well in your life. People usually want to blame what's other people, other things. Well, I tried that, but it didn't work <laughs> it didn't well, work. well <laughs> enough. But I was well motivated. I, I couldn't afford it. I mean, it's a very expensive process. I'm sure. Personal analysis uh, in Zurich at the time was something like 150 francs an hour. In the States, I think it's usually between 100 and 130 dollars an hour. Uh, not many people can afford it or the time involved. Right. Because there's not only time away from income from uh, work, from daily work, but uh, the time involved in working on yourself, attending to your dreams, reading, uh, it's very difficult with a family to keep track of yourself. So the question is then, why do it? With the hope that you'll be a more substantial person. Yes. Eventually, th through that process, and that there's no viable alternative. There's no viable alternative. For a lot of us, there isn't. Well, you've experienced something similar. I have. I understand. Yes, I have. And that was the only way for me. You say that once you got to Zurich, I love this, you fell in with a shadow companion, Fraser Boa. What is a shadow companion? It's someone <laughs> who shares some values uh, but from a different point of view. <laughs> okay. Uh, he represented to me uh, everything I wasn't, mm -hmm. um, which is part and parcel of how Jung describes the shadow. Mm -hmm. It's an al alter ego who functions differently and has different values. I, I like the emphasis on the word different because I think... In popular culture, the word shadow is synonymous with the word evil. And shadow and evil are not, the shadow is not necessarily evil. Right, I agree. Uh, the shadow may be very creative mm -hmm. in that it represents a side of the personality that is unfamiliar and unknown, but potentially creative, and the, the fellow I men mentioned that I lived with, Fraser Boa, was, uh, functioned differently mm -hmm. than I did typologically. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot uh, from him of how to tolerate someone who s experienced the world in a completely different way. Yeah, I was going to say, wouldn't you, by nature, clash with somebody that was so different from you, both as a shadow figure and different typologically? How did that work? Well, you you may naturally clash with them, but if you're alert, you realize that what you're seeing is in yourself mm -hmm. in terms of projection. Right. And if you can take that back, you can assimilate some of the traits that the other person has that are valuable mm -hmm. to you. And in our case, it was the intuition that I came to appreciate that he 
uh, had in spades, and he came to appreciate my sensation function. Mm -hmm. So although we were opposites, we were complementary mm. and balanced each other out mm -hmm. in a way. Now, it's shadow is something that you work on forever because there are always new things coming up from the unconscious that you didn't know were there. Mm -hmm. and they can be constellated, activated, when you meet someone new mm -hmm. or find yourself in a new situation mm -hmm. or a new job. Uh, it involves activating different complexes in yourself, which are all... Everything is part of the shadow until it's differentiated. Mm -hmm. And then it can be assimilated into consciousness, which is an expansion of the ego, which usually produces a good deal of inflation in the individual. Suddenly everything becomes clear. You think you know it all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So by the time I came back from Zurich to Toronto, I could see myself touring the country, curing people of schizophrenia and other <laughs> mental illnesses. <laughs> Completely unrealistic, but mm -hmm. inflated. Mm -hmm. Because my head was filled with material that had previously been unconscious mm, and inaccessible to me. I mean, it, the inflation settles down when you get to function appropriately in the real world. Mm -hmm. Then you f are liable to experience the opposite, which we call negative inflation, where you think you're no good at all. Right. Tell us that mantra, the mantra that is at the root of inner city books, where you... You just put your head down and do the work that's in front of you, and then 30 years later you wake up and you've published billions of books, and you have traveled the world and cured people. Yes, it's thoughtful of you to remind me. So the, there's a mantra that you have at Inner City Books? And he wheels it Well, into for it. myself, really. Uh, do what is right in front of you. Didn't Jung say something like, follow your nose because that's your way? Uh, that would be a simplistic way to say mm -hmm. it. I'm sure he but said the, it a lot better than that. <laughs> the energy energy is key. Where does your energy want to go? Now, if somebody's an accountant and he'd rather be a, playing the bassoon, you can see how unhappy he might be in his personal life. Mm -hmm. You use the word differentiate, and that word, I come across that word a lot in the material. What does that mean to differentiate the contents? Well, when something bothers you or annoys you, and it's clear in our terms that you're complex, mm -hmm. a complex has been activated, mm -hmm. what is involved in that takes a process of differentiation. Is it, is it some shadow aspect of myself or is it the feminine side of myself responding to something in the environment or something I did? Uh, can you clarify that question? Well, you're on, on track because I get asked that question a lot on Twitter when somebody will say, well, what is it? Is it this or is it that? And they're trying to differentiate and they want an answer. I don't have the answer for them, they have the answer. So what do you do when you are differentiating? You keep asking yourself the question? You keep, uh, you keep chewing on it. Mm -hmm. You do something uh, about it, like write or draw, mm -hmm. or paint, sculpt, dance. Uh, you're looking for the meaning of what the complex is trying to say to you. Like you with the elephant. Yes. Mm -hmm. So getting back to your shadow companion, you said that um, our dismal state was echoed by others in training, which is to say we were all there because we had run afoul of our own psychology. I love that statement. What did you mean by that? 
Well, that's a good question. At this distance, I'm not quite sure, but I can make it up on the run here. Because of our own psychology, we had run into brick walls Mm -hmm. in our life that we could not cope with. Situations in which we didn't know how to function or found it impossible to function and go on, go forward. And we became therefore listless or in a state of what we might call loss of soul. Mm -hmm. You were a little bit envious of uh, Fraser because von Franz was his analyst. Yes. But she was all booked up and and, uh, she didn't have room for you. You said something interesting here uh, that when Fraser would get back from his, his analytic hour with von Franz, you two would chew over for hours what she had said, he wrote. You said that you were continually in awe of his account of von Franz's understanding of his dreams. He would tell her a dream and stammer a few associations, and she would come back with a full-blown interpretation of what the unconscious was saying to compensate his conscious attitude. Yes. And my analyst would always remind me constantly that dreams are compensatory. And whenever I see anything about dream interpretation out there, I never see that men- out outside of the Jungian world. I never see that mentioned. So could you talk a little bit about how dreams compensate our conscious attitudes? Yes. In general terms, dreams either confirm your conscious position mm-hmm. or they have nothing to do with it or they give you an opposite point of view on your conscious ego position, attitude. That's the meaning of compensation. Mm -hmm. Most helpful are dreams and synchronistic events that tell you something that was completely unknown to you before, Mm -hmm. that you have to mull over to find the meaning of. I mean, in what way does this compensate? You know, through the day, you go through a lot of events. Right. What is this image in the dream compensating for? Was it when I met Joe, or was it when I was making love with Sylvia? Mm -hmm. Or when I went shopping and got a crush on the cashier, or anything else? You have to dig into your Mm -hmm. experience of yourself and put it beside your dream images and see where they clash or coincide in order and this you have to do this over time Mm -hmm. uh you can't right off the bat i couldn't as von franz apparently could you know it's a lengthy process right takes time and uh if you persevere and research the images that come up Mm -hmm. i mean if you dream about Cougars, you need your personal association, uh, you need uh, historical guideposts. It's particularly difficult when you dream about different women mm-hmm. because men live in such a psychic harem. Mm. And you know, anywhere from Nixies to Pixies can turn up and uh, re- representing different aspects of a man's emotional presence in the world. So this is why it's helpful to have an analyst help you interpret your <clears> dreams. <throat> well, it's, it's, I would say it's impossible without a dialogue with a vis-a-vis, a personal person opposite you. Someone who knows. To help you tease out over time what's going on in your unconscious. So that is important to know. What would you say about people using dream symbol dictionaries to interpret their dreams? Well, it's too simple because there's no one interpretation of an, of an image, mm-hmm. or of a symbol. Jung's definition of a symbol is that it's the best expression for something essentially unknown. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's not a sign like an SO gasoline sign. Right. 
a symbol is essentially, its meaning is essentially unknown until you unpack its meaning by digging into it, particularly some creative uh, practice. So it's what that symbol means for you. For, for me, not for anyone else, mm-hmm. right? No, dream dictionaries can just be misleading. Symbol, symbol dictionaries can be very helpful. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have several, a couple on the shelf up there. The Herder's Symbol Dictionary is one. So is there a difference between an archetypal dream and a personal dream? Yes, in the general terms, I think you mean uh, we would call a an archetypal dream, a big dream, mm-hmm. one that has an explosive significance in your life as opposed to a personal, a, a dream that has only personal significance in, in a superficial way in your life. Mm-hmm. A big dream might even be, have, be significant for a whole group of people, mm-hmm. a tribe. Uh, traditionally, that is true of so-called native populations. Their leaders would often have big dreams that led them to places of water and Mm -hmm. food and shelter. So the difference between archetypal and big, they're, they're the same, but between archetypal and personal, although the personal dream may have archetype archetypal images in them they are limited to the to their personal importance so getting back to von franz you said that you mm-hmm. had analytic sessions with her on two occasions about a year apart yes so you actually did get to have some time one on one with her yes and what was your experience of her oh warm uh, receptive Perceptive, uh, completely alert, uh, strong, strong thinking function, but not lacking in empathy. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, she was a delight to sit with as someone you could respect that had enormous knowledge of images and uh, historical events. You had said that uh, when she, you had chosen her to test you for your midterms and the time that she called you a stupid ninny, um, you had also mentioned that she said to you when you kind of blanked out when she was testing you, that she said, you're either a stupid ninny and shouldn't be here at all, or you have talents as yet undiscovered, (laughs) which clearly... Is, was the case. The I think latter. I might have made that up. Oh. Talents as yet undiscovered. Because okay. it sounds well. well she, and she saw that. Uh, I get, well, I hope she did mm-hmm. because that's what turned out to be true. Yeah. And that in the two years after that, b- between the midterms and the, and the final, you said that um, you spent less time frolicking and more on why you were there. You had re- reread all of her books, and um, and then and then you had her retest you. I like that you said that you during the se- your second half of training you spent more time on why you were there. Yes, uh, instead of frolicking. Instead. Frolicking is you know haunting the pubs in the evening. Um, hanging out in the Niederdorf, which is the lower town of Zurich, Mm -hmm. where shadowy things happen. I find that interesting that Mm -hmm. even though you had been through everything you had been through and you had been in the training program in Zurich for two years, you were still frolicking. Well, because I wanted to experience my shadow. I see, I see. At least that was my excuse. (laughs) After your training, 1978, you were 42 years old, and you returned here to Toronto as a certified union analyst. And you said you were still restless. And I love this quote because I can relate to it. You said, I had so much energy, I thought I might explode. 
Theoretically, it is possible. E equals MC squared. If you have no place to put your energy, it could build up inside until poof, a burst of flame, and at the speed of light, you're toast. <laughs> yes. So what happened then? You were finished with your training, you're back in Toronto, then what? Well, I still fancied myself as a writer. Mm -hmm. And so I rewrote my thesis to what I thought was a manuscript worth being published about Kafka's, about, uh, I called it the secret raven, conflict and transformation in the life of Franz Kafka. So I wasn't concentrated, I didn't feel competent in a literary way to analyze his novels, mm. though I enjoyed reading them. I concentrated on his diaries, right. in which I found evidence of Pu'er psychology. I see. And then I, as the more I realized that I had identified with uh, Kafka's plight for no good reason, because I was as far away from a Kafka personality mm -hmm. as one might imagine, but I res responded to his diary entries with uh, anguish and despair, as as he did. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was expressing his anguish and despair, and I took it on. Mm -hmm. And that goes back 15 years before I went to Zurich. Uh, during analysis, I became aware that he was as much of a Pu'er as I was. Mm -hmm. And so I endeavored in the writing of my thesis for the graduation, I endeavored to pull out of his diaries examples of what I felt was were symptoms of his Pu'er psychology. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wrote it and felt it was ready to be published, especially because it was a propitious year, I think it's a hundred years after his birth and fifty years after he died. But all I, I got was rejection slips. So Fraser and Marion encouraged me to publish it myself. Mm -hmm. They said, you have the tools, and that was true, because I had worked, been working for years with publishers, editing other uh, other people's work. Uh, so I decided I would do that, but I didn't want to become a one-pony publishing house right. and just publish myself. So I invited other analysts to send me their manuscripts. And Fraser helped me design the logo that goes with inner city books. Mm -hmm. And the first, after I published The Secret Raven, uh, first, and then I had in hand several mimeographed manuscripts of von Francis mm -hmm. that I'd brought home from Zurich that you could only buy in Zurich mm, okay. from in the library. So I phoned her and told her what I was going to do and asked her permission if I could publish these unpublished manuscripts. And she was absolutely thrilled. She remembered me. I was careful to call in the morning when I was aware that she would just come in from the garden. Mm -hmm. And uh, I dared to ask her to be my honorary patron. And she was thrilled at that wow. request too. So that's uh, what happened and subsequently Marion Woodman uh, offered me her diploma thesis, The Owl Was a Baker's Daughter, and we worked on that together and turned it into a book and then Addiction to Perfection, which we turned into a book together, and The Pregnant Virgin, mm -hmm. her three best known books I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, those, and those took several years to put together. The theses are notoriously uh, academic and unpublishable. I see. And so they have to be reshaped and 
mm. preferably edited by a professional editor. Well, what you say in the in the introduction to The Secret Raven about what the book is about, you wrote, my aim has not been to explain or interpret Kafka's creative work. Rather, I have tried to illuminate some of the psychological factors involved in his conflicts, paying special attention to the compensatory significance of some of his dreams. Yes, what is the question? No question, just a statement that I love this book. Oh, I'm so pleased to hear it. And it is a great example of dream interpretation because you you didn't know him, clearly. You, you hadn't met him. Um, but you're able to see inside a little bit. Well, possibly because I identified with him so yeah. much. Mm-hmm. That's how Inner City Books got started. I yes. mean, that's pretty great company, Marie-Louise von Franz and Marion Woodman. Yes, and soon after, Edinger found me. Oh, but before that, Sylvia Brinton Pereira's book, Descent to the Goddess, took off like a rocket. Nobody had ever written or published a book revealing the shadow side of women uh, in such uh, mythic detail. Mm -hmm. It was extraordinary, the response to that book. I think we've sold 60 or 70,000 copies Mm -hmm. over the years. Uh, Marion's addiction, Marion's three books that I published sold over 100,000. The world was, at, in the early 80s, was, in the early 1980s, was hungry for Jungian psychology. Mm-hmm. It's fallen off somewhat since, I think, at least for Inner City, and although we started and nurtured a trend, other publishers saw that there was, finally saw there was a market in mm. such material, mm-hmm. and so other analysts started publishing with other publishers. So we didn't get so many submissions. You had published three more of von Franz's manuscripts before she died. Uh, the Puer book? No, that came after she died. It was I had permission. Just the year before she died, she gave me permission to publish a new edition based on the original. Mm -hmm. A couple years before she died, she offered you archetypal patterns and fairy tales. Yes. Uh, The reprint rights to C.G. Jung, His Myth in Our Time. Yes, that's the the intellectual side of her. Yes. And it is one of the best intellectual biography of Jung, I believe. And one of my personal favorites, The Cat, A Tale of Feminine Redemption. Yes. So her biography of Jung, C.G. Jung, His Myth in Our Time, I don't think a lot of people know that that's out there. When they are looking for a biography of Jung, they go to Memories, Dreams, Reflections, but von Franz's account, she met him when she was 18 years old. Yes. And she was with him until he died in 1961. And she puts him in a, in an intellectual and temporal context and concludes that he was one of the greatest men of the 20th century, which isn't, I think, adequately recognized yet. And Jung always suggested that perhaps he was 50 years, it would be 50 years after his death before people would understand what he'd done. So I hope we will have another session. Well, we just skimmed Laura. over over Edinger, and yes. we, we've we've definitely have to cover him because he's a huge figure and played a huge role in inner city books. Yes, so. and uh, I, before we started recording, you asked me why I chose to publish the manuscripts of other analysts that I did. And my criterion from the beginning has been to accept manuscripts that showed a deep experiential interest in the topic Mm -hmm. that they're writing about, Mm -hmm. not an academic overview. 
and not uh, a selection of essays by different analysts. I wanted a single author, single theme manuscript from these people, which they readily supplied, though I haven't had a new submission for some time. Uh, the latest book is this love drama of C.G. Young, which I think convincingly shows the influence of Young's love life on his ideas mm -hmm. and on his writing of the Red Book, which has become so famous in the last few years, published in 2009, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I've reached out to the author of the love drama, and hopefully uh, she'll agree to be interviewed for this podcast. That would be wonderful. Yes. Uh, she herself is not a Jungian analyst. She's the only one of my authors who isn't. She has a PhD in psychology, uh, but her husband is a Jungian analyst. So he didn't write the book. He wrote it, but she would, would bounce ideas off him. Right. That wasn't she wrote it, yeah. Very helpful, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, she herself did the research for it and put together what he calls the Ariadne thread of Jung's mm. amours. Okay then, Daryl, thank you so much for your time today. This is just the beginning, hopefully. We'll talk again soon. Well, yes, I hope so, Yumi and Laura. As you continue with your project, uh, I'm sure you will find other analyst authors that I've published uh, quite as open and interesting and interested to be uh, consulted about their work. So I wish you luck on that endeavor, and you're following your energy just as I advise my clients. Thank you, Daryl. You're welcome. Happy trip back. So there you have it. That was my first go at this. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I hope to get better with experience because I have a lot of interviews planned and a lot of important material I'd like to talk about. In each episode, I'll be interviewing a Jungian analyst about a book they've written. Inner City Books has published over 140 titles, so there are many different topics in the field of Jungian psychology that I'll be covering. If you'd indulge me for just a moment, I want to thank the people who have made this project possible. It's been a long trip getting here, and it certainly would not exist without them. My longtime analysts, Diane Braden, Liz Jefferson and Daryl Sharp of Inner City Books, Richard Sweeney and Gina Peacock of the Jung Association of Central Ohio, and Megan McIntyre and Jessica Hart of the C.G. Jung Center in Evanston. Technical guidance from Chris Brennan of the Astrology Podcast, Dr. Dave of Shrink Rep Radio, Eric Francis of Planet Waves FM, and Todd Petty of Websites Made Simple. My teachers, Art Bell, Richard C. Hoagland, William Henry, John Lash, Robert Hand, John Herlosky, David Morehouse, Robert Bouval, and Robert W. Sullivan IV. My Twitter friends, MJ Walters, Brian Collinson, and John Amenta, whose presence has kept me focused over the years. Friends are very important to me. We don't individuate alone. We need mirrors, and I've had some great ones. Dave Bregman, Berge Nigerian, Nita Sweeney, and Charlie Arthur, I wouldn't be here or anywhere without you. Please visit the website speakingofjung.com for more information about today's guest, as well as links to the books we've discussed. On the website, you'll also find some information about Jung himself and links to his books as well. I've also started a blog where I've posted two short videos that I took at Inner City Books, one of Daryl's elephant collection and the other of his alchemical snake ring. This is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung. Mm -hmm.